update and your laughter knows that you're listening to me. So thank you for that. Here we go. Mark chapter 2 verse 1. Forgiven. What a great passage of scripture here. If you're able to stand, why don't you stand with me this morning and we'll look here at this passage. And it says there, and when he returned to Capernaum after some days, it was reported that he was at home. And many were gathered together so that there was no more room, not even at the door. And he was preaching the word to them. And they came bringing to him a paralytic carried by four men. And when they could not get near him because of the crowd, because of the crowd, they, <clears throat> excuse me, they removed the roof above him. And when they had made an opening, they let down the bed on which the paralytic lay. And when Jesus saw their faith, he said to the paralytic, Son, your sins are forgiven. Now some of the scribes were sitting there questioning in their hearts, Why does this man speak like that? He is blaspheming. Who can forgive sins but God alone? And immediately Jesus, perceiving in his spirit that they thus questioned within themselves, said to them, Why do you question these things in your hearts? Which is easier to say to the paralytic, Your sins are forgiven, or to say, Rise, take up your bed, and walk. But that you may know that the Son of Man has authority on earth to forgive sins, he said to the paralytic, I say to you, Rise, pick up your bed, and go home. And he rose and immediately picked up his bed and went out before them all, so that they were all amazed and glorified God, saying, We never saw anything like this. Well, Lord Jesus, I thank you that you do things, Jesus, that nobody's ever seen before. And you're able to do things, Jesus, that we couldn't even fathom to think about. And I thank you, Jesus, that you took a man who could not walk, that was crippled, that was, that, that was paralyzed, rather. And you used him as a wonderful, um, a wonderful tool, as a vessel to communicate to us that we can be forgiven and that you, Jesus, can forgive sins. Lord Jesus, surely if you can make a man who was paralyzed to walk again, then Lord Jesus, you can forgive us of our sins. I pray today that there would be no one leave here this morning not knowing and experiencing the fullness of your forgiveness in their lives. Lord, I pray that you would help those who have never come to know you as their Savior like Royce has. I pray that they will take a step of faith to receive Christ as our Savior. They would not say, well, I'm good to go. I've been baptized. or I'm good to go. I've been a member of a church. I've got a Bible. But they would come to know you, Jesus, and receive you to be saved in the Lord of their lives. Lord, speak to our hearts now and assure us in your love and may we walk in your forgiveness as we trust you. And we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. You may be seated. Well, friends, I believe that God has set this passage before us in the Gospel Mark to show us that Christ Jesus can forgive our sins. We say, Pastor, that's simple enough. I've been in church all my life. But I want you to understand that Christ Jesus can forgive our sins. And if we've come to receive Him as our Savior and the Lord of our lives, we've realized that we have sinned against Jesus and we've come to Him and say, Jesus, I need you to forgive me. I give you my life. Then we are forgiven because Jesus Christ has forgiven us of our sins because Jesus can do that. Perhaps you're here this morning and you're not, you've not been much faithful to church. You've not much grown up in church. Maybe you're here this morning, been in and out of church all your lives. Well, however you came this morning, I'm just thankful that you're here. But I want you to know that Jesus is the only one that can truly forgive us of our sins. And that He can truly forgive our sins. His primary ministry in this passage is clearly illustrated for us this morning. He heals a paralytic man. And by doing so, he shows us that he can forgive sins. Now, friends, you look at the passage this morning, and you see that Jesus is gathered together, and there are so many people with Jesus that there's nowhere else for anybody to come in before him. Jesus is there and there are these men that decide that they have a friend of theirs that's paralyzed and cannot walk. So they decide that they're going to take this man to Jesus. 
Because they believe that Jesus can do something for this man that nobody else can do. So they bring this man to Jesus on his cot and they take him and they try to get him in the presence of Christ. They want to get him right in the very presence of Christ. There were so many people that they could not get him into the presence of Jesus. And so they go up on the roof of this house. And I want you to think about the roof of the house, not in the terms of a roof like we have on this church or perhaps the roof that you have on your home, you know, where we might dig through shingles and sheet rock, uh, excuse me, plywood and tar paper and nails and then through insulation in an attic and then lower the man down into the presence of Christ. I don't want you to think about digging a hole through the roof in terms of our, uh, our Western architecture. I want you to think about the terms, the, the thing, the, I want you to think about the roof in terms of a flat roof that was capable of being uh, peeled back, if you will, and a, a, a hole created big enough for this man to be lowered down into the presence of Jesus. And so these men took their friend up on the roof, they dug the hole, they lowered the man down into the presence of Jesus, and there he lay, helpless before Jesus. The three men standing there anticipating that Jesus was going to make this man walk again. Can you imagine the anticipation of the men as they, as they lowered this man down in the presence of Jesus? They didn't know what Jesus was going to do. They were just banking that He was going to do what they believed He could do. And they waited. I don't know how long the wait was. It might have just been a few seconds. But can you imagine the anticipation? After all, these men sold out everything they had to bring this man to Jesus. Anybody ever done anything like that? I mean, you've taken such a bold step that you're thinking, man, if this fails, I'm gonna, I don't know what's going to happen. I'm going to either look like a goofball. I don't know what's going to happen. If, I, if Jesus doesn't do, I mean, what are we going to do? Raise this man back up out of the roof? As Jesus said, sorry, guys, office is closed. I don't have time for this. What do you guys think you're doing? I mean, what kind of response was they going to get from Jesus? Well, the response they got was that Jesus looked at this man and he didn't tell him to get up and walk. He initially told him, son, your sins are forgiven. <laughs> now, now, that's not maybe exactly what the three men thought was going to happen, but that's what Jesus did and said to them, you know what? Your sins are forgiven. Well, wait a minute, Jesus, we want the man to walk. And Jesus took this paralyzed man and did the impossible. Now, friends, you know, there's an unfortunate um, disability that folks have in life that people can experience, and it's paralysis. And, and I've, I've, I've known people that are paralyzed. They, 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 by injury, they have ha something happened to them, and they are, they are left paralyzed. They cannot walk. All modern medicine, as good as modern medicine is, cannot restore function to the spinal column in folks who are injured so as to cause the nerves to be healed and the spinal cord to be, uh, to be made well and for there to be nerve function in their extremities and so they are left paralyzed, unable to walk. Some folks are left paralyzed not because of injury but because of a debilitating disease. And their muscles atrophy and their joints freeze up and they cannot move their extremities and they're left paralyzed, unable to move. And friends, we have some, some pretty good modern medicine. But still the thing in modern medicine that cannot be conquered is paralysis. You think about it. How many people do you know that was paralyzed either by accident or by disease and they're longing for a cure, but as good as doctors are, they cannot make them walk again? Most of the time in a paralysis situation, the doctors and the therapists and the people with power and the people with skill and ability, what they try to do is accommodate them and provide for them a, a way, a, a, a comfortable way to live and the adequate amenities in their home so they can get around in their paralyzed state. But give them their ability to walk again, they cannot do. Jesus, in this situation, looks upon this man with mercy. And he makes him walk again. And in so making him walk again, he proves to everyone there and to us today that if he can make a man that's paralyzed walk again, then he can forgive us of our sins. 
Now friends, this morning there's three reasons that I want to share with you as to why you can experience forgiveness. The number one, uh, the first thing I want to share with you is this. Jesus knows your condition. He knows your condition. He's omniscient. He knows everything. He knows all about you. There's nothing that he doesn't know. Jesus knows everything about you. In John chapter 4, there's a woman that comes to Jesus, that, that Jesus meets. Jesus is traveling, and in John chapter 4, he meets this woman there at the well. In verse 1 of John chapter 4, Jesus learned that the Pharisees had heard that Jesus was making and baptizing more disciples than John. He left Judea, departed again for Galilee, and he had to pass through Samaria. And he came to a town of Samaria called Sychar, near the field that Jacob had given to his son Joseph. Jacob's well was there, we find in Scripture. And so Jesus was wearied as, from his journey, and he was sitting beside the well, and there was a woman that came to this well. And he looked at this woman, and he asked this woman, Give me a drink. The disciples had gone away to buy food. And the Samaritan woman said, How is it that you, a Jew, ask for a drink from me, a woman of Samaria? And Jesus has an inter interaction with this lady. This lady was not, um, you might say, a, a godly woman. She was a sinner. That's why she was there in this part of the day. Jesus said to her, well, go call your husband and come here. And the woman answered, I have no husband. And Jesus, knowing her, said to her, you are right in saying, I have no husband, for you've had five husbands, and the one you now have is not your husband. What you have said is true. <laughs> this woman does something that perhaps you and I would have done. You're standing there in the presence of this man, and he says to you, go call your husband you don't say, well, you know what? Nobody would say this. You don't say, well, you know what? I'm glad you asked me that. I'm not married. I'm living with a man in adultery. I've had a lot of other men. That's just kind of who I am. You know, I sleep around a lot. But thanks for asking me about my husband. I mean, do we, is that the kind of stuff we say? And you know, Jesus looks at us and says, you know what, why don't you go call your husband? No, this lady doesn't, doesn't disclose all this. All of her life to Jesus. And you know what, you and I, we sometimes, we like to make up, don't we? We like to put on, we don't say, how are you today? Well, you don't know, I've been struggling depression all week. I, I failed. I, I, I said something I shouldn't have said. I did this. I, don't, I did that. We don't do that, do we? We don't, if some stranger came up to us, say, well, hey, uh, go do this or do that or tell me who you are. We don't disclose. We, we do the same thing the Samaritan woman does. But you know the thing about it? Jesus knows everything about us. He knows everything about us. There's nothing that we can cover up. There's no facade that we can put on. There's no face that we can put on. We can't try to convince somebody otherwise. But Jesus knows everything about us. He knows our struggles. He knows our temptations. He knows our thoughts. He knows our sins. Every one of them. Every sin we've ever committed, Jesus knows. He said, Pastor, that's scary. Jesus knows everything I, I, I've done. Psalm 139, it says this of the Lord. Oh Lord, you've searched me and known me. You know when I sit down, when I rise up. You discern my thoughts from afar. You search out my path and my lying down and are acquainted with all my ways. Even before a word is on my tongue, behold, oh Lord, you know it all together. You hem me in behind and before you lay your hand upon me. Such knowledge is too wonderful for me. It is high, I cannot attain it. Where shall I go from your spirit or where shall I flee from your presence? If I ascend to heaven, you are there. If I make my bed in Sheol, you are there. If I take the wings of the morning and dwell in the uttermost parts of the sea, even there your hand will lead me. 
shall lead me, and your right hand shall hold me. If I say, surely the darkness shall, overcome, uh, shall cover me, and the light about me is be night, even the darkness is not dark to you, and the night is as bright as day, for darkness is light to you, is as light with you. What we learn of the Lord in Psalm 139 is exactly what we know of Jesus. He knows us. He knows when we lie down. He's acquainted with all our ways. Before there's a word on our tongue, He knows. He knows us all. And the very, that, that, that's a scary thought. He said, Pastor, nobody knows me like that. Nobody knows me like Jesus. But I want you to know I'm glad that Jesus knows me like that. I'm glad He knows me and I'm glad He knows you like that. And you know what? In light of what Jesus knows about us, He still chooses to lay down His life for us and to die for us and to offer us something only He can offer us. That's forgiveness. You look here in the Scripture and you see there that this man is brought to Jesus. Or brought to Jesus. And He looked at this man and He said, Son... Your sins are forgiven. Now, this man, we don't get an idea, at least by, from, from Mark, that this man asked anything of Jesus. Jesus just looks upon this man, and he knows full well what this man needs. He knows full well that this man needs forgiven. He knows that he needs forgiven. And not only does he know this man needs forgiven, he does something about what he knows. You see, friends, Jesus knows our spiritual condition. He knows us. If we were the paralyzed man lowered down before him from the roof down on this cot in our paralyzed state, he would look upon us and say, I know what this one needs. This one needs forgiven. He needs forgiven. This one she needs forgiven. They need forgiven. You know what, friends? We're all sinners, aren't we? We're all sinners. Every one of us. How do we know we're sinners? Well, the Bible says we've all sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. Well, what is sin? When I'm talking with children and counseling them, maybe at vacation Bible school, or whatever, I talk to kids, and one of the very first things we've got to understand if they're going to understand salvation is they need to understand that they're sinners, right? I mean, if we're going to be saved from something, we need to understand what we're being saved from. And the best way I know to help people understand, not only to understand and acknowledge that the Bible says that we're all sinners and we've fallen short of the glory of God, but you know, there's a clear way we can understand we're sinners. God gave us a standard. It's called the Ten Commandments. And one of the Ten Commandments is that we shouldn't tell a lie. You ever told a lie before? One of the Ten Commandments is we should always put God first. We should always have Him first in our life. Have you always put God first in your life? You can go on and on through those Ten Commandments. The Bible says we should always obey and honor our father and mother. I bet every one of you here this morning, at some point or another, got in trouble when you were a kid. Because mom and dad told you to do something, and you didn't do it. You dishonored them. You disobeyed them. And the thing is, if we examine our lives in light of God's standard, what we find is that we've broken the Ten Commandments and we've sinned against God. And Jesus looks upon us and says, yep, you're a sinner. But the wonderful thing is he doesn't just leave us there. We're sinners and Jesus knows it. But what he knows about us, he also knows how to change us. Which brings me to my second point this morning. We can experience the forgiveness of God because Jesus knows who we are. And yet he's not turned off by that. Number two, Jesus is capable of providing your cure. The second reason why we experience the forgiveness is Jesus is capable of providing your cure. He's omnipotent. He's all powerful. There's nothing he cannot do. And I want you to think about for a minute the kinds of things that you've seen Jesus do. What kind of things can Jesus do? He can do anything. He can do anything. It, the Bible tells us that Jesus was in the beginning with God creating God in Genesis chapter 1, you see where God says, let us make man in our own image. Let us make man. Well, who's God talking about let us? He's talking about the Trinity. He's talking about God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit in the beginning creating. And Colossians tells us that Jesus was there in the beginning creating. 
And Jesus is a great creator. He's there. He is God and he, he can do anything. And if this Jesus who can do anything says that he can forgive us, then friends, he's going to forgive us, right? You see, friends, before you can trust someone, you must know that they can do what they're capable of saying they can do. You're trusting them. There's a story that came out. I don't have the author on this, so I can't quote the author, but these are not my words. This is um, it's actually a, a, there's a, a history, a daily history tweet that gets posted on Twitter, and there's some very interesting facts on there. This man by the name of Adolfo Kaminsky, at the age of 17, became a member of the French resistance following the tragic loss of his mother to the Nazis in 1941. And throughout World War II, he dedicated most of his time to operating in an underground laboratory located in Paris where he skillfully fabricated passports. His remarkable efforts are believed to have safeguarded the lives of approximately 14,000 French Jews. He says, I always remember, Kaminsky says, I always remember our biggest request for documents, 300 children, in three days. It seemed impossible. I had to remain awake for as long as I could. Fighting against sleep, the math was simple. I could produce 30 fake documents in an hour. If I allowed myself to sleep for even one hour, 30 lives would be at risk. My greatest fear was making a technical mistake, overlooking any small detail, the fate of a human being depending on each document. So I toiled relentlessly until exhaustion overcame me. Upon waking up, I resumed my work. There was no room for us to pause. Kaminsky passed away on January 9th, 2023 at the age of 97. He produced and gave to those who needed deliverance what they needed to see their lives delivered from ultimate death. They, the, the, these, these, these French Jews would put their lives in his hands as he produced documents that would set them free. They were completely dependent on him. Everything in this passport would have to be exactly the way it was supposed to be. And upon any close examination, it would have to, have to appear as if it were absolutely authentic. <coughs> and so... These French Jews would put their fate in this man's hands. The unique thing was he was capable of coming through and producing documents that were, that were appeared authentic and would see these thousands of French Jews' lives saved. Did he have the ability to do that? Apparently he did. You see, friends, what we have to look at in Scripture when we look at our lives and say we're sinners, that we need a Savior, then we have to examine and search who is it that can save me and who is it that can forgive me. Jesus is presented here in Scripture as the one who can. You look in verse 6. Now some of the scribes were sitting there questioning their hearts. Jesus just looked at this man and said, Son, your sins are forgiven. Why does this man, they say, speak like this? He is blaspheming. Who can forgive sins but God alone? Well, they state the obvious. Who can do this but God? Well, nobody can. And that's the point. Since Jesus is doing it, since Jesus is saying, I forgive you, then he is saying he is God. So I want you to understand something. If you're looking for somebody to forgive you of your sins... I want you to know you're not going to see your sins washed away by baptism. You're not going to see your sins remedied by doing good, enough good to outweigh the bad things you've done in life. There's no way that can happen. There's no way that the waters of baptism can wash away your sins because that's not what the waters of baptisms is about. There's no way that you can do that. You cannot go to a Catholic priest to tell him your sins and see him forgive your sins because he has no authority to do so. There's no way for your sins to be forgiven other than Jesus. And why? Because Jesus is God and He has secured and made possible your forgiveness. Secondly, friends, you not only see that Jesus is God and has the authority to forgive us of our sins, He also <coughs> healed the man and raised the man to life, or to, to walk again, rather.
And he says in verse 10, But that you may know that the Son of Man has authority on earth to forgive sins. He said to the paralytic, I say to you, rise, pick up your, your bed and go home. And immediately he rose up. This man came on a cot carried by others. And he left with his cot under his arm carrying it himself. How is it possible it's possible because Jesus can do that. And what we see in Scripture, since Jesus can do that, we have to realize that Jesus is the answer and only Jesus for the, being able to forgive us of our sins. And if He is God and He can make a paralyzed man walk, the conclusion that we are left to draw upon studying and examining the Gospel of Mark is that Jesus is the one that can do it for me. And if He doesn't do it for me, then I remain unforgiven. Jesus is able. He has authority and He can make the lame to walk. Number three, the third reason, very quickly. Jesus' forgiveness will release you from your sins. It will release you from your sins. He looks at this man and He said, Son, your sins are forgiven. The Greek word is aphiemi and it's to release from legal or moral obligation or consequence, to cancel, to remit, to pardon, to release. Friends, I, I... You ever been released from something? Released. I got released one day. I was driving down Main Street here in Joplin, and I was coming back from the hospital. And uh, I was... Um, I was kind of in my own world. I wasn't really having that great a morning, and I was just kind of... Well, I was going too fast. <laughs> That's what I was doing. And my bad morning got a little worse when I passed the highway patrol and he decided to uh, stop me and as I say before, recognize my speed. So I saw the patrolman coming and I happened to look down at my dash. At the time I looked up at the same time I looked at my dash to see how fast I was going, I also looked up to see the speed limit sign that I just passed and the numbers didn't match up. The number on my dashboard was around 57, and the number on the speed limit sign was 45. So I looked at my rearview mirror, he turned around, and I just went ahead and pulled over. I was probably almost pulled over by the time he got turned around, because I knew he was, I knew I was going too fast. So he stopped, he came up, talked to me a minute, said, hey, you know, asked me a few questions, and I said, yeah, and I handed him my stuff. He, he uh, he went back and checked, my, checked me out and brought my license back and everything. And, you know, basically he was really nice. He said, just slow down. Okay. And he released me. <laughs> he released me without payment to, to the State Department, right? He released me. He let me go. It feels good to get released, doesn't it? Anybody ever been released like that? You've been given one of those warnings, don't do that again, but you get released without need for payment. I got released. It feels good to get released. But I'm telling you what it feels most good about getting released is when we've sinned against a holy God and we say, Jesus, forgive me, and He releases me of my sins and the consequences that come along with those sins. He releases me. He pardons me. He sets me free. He tells this man, Son, your sins are forgiven. Get up and go home. And the Bible tells us that this man was forgiven of his sins. He was forgiven. You know, the Bible has much to say about forgiveness, and I want to share just a few passages with you. But in Psalm 103, Bless the Lord, O my soul, and all that is within me. Bless His holy name. Bless the Lord, O my soul, and forget not all His benefits. And what are those benefits? Well, who forgives all your iniquity, who heals all your diseases, who redeems your life from the pit, who crowns you with steadfast love and mercy, who satisfies you with good so that your youth is renewed like the eagles. Psalm 103, verse 11, For as high as the heavens are above the earth, so great is His steadfast love toward those who fear Him. As far as the east is from the west, so far does He remove our transgressions from us. Psalm 130, verse 3 through 4, If you, O Lord, should mark iniquities, O Lord, who could stand? But with you there is forgiveness that you may be feared. Friends, He cleanses us of our sins. And 1 John chapter 1, verse 9 says, If we confess our sins, He's faithful and just to cleanse us of our sins and forgive us of all unrighteousness. To 
Give, to forgive us our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. And furthermore, we find in Scripture, not only does He cleanse us of our sins, but He also, He doesn't remember our sins. The Bible says in Hebrews 8 verse 12, For I will be merciful toward their iniquities, and I will remember their sins no more. Isaiah 43, 25, I, I am He who blots out our, your transgressions for my own sake, and I will not remember your sins. Friends, we're blessed. If we've been forgiven, we're blessed. Because we've been cleansed of our sin. Because those things that we've done that maybe we remember, if we've confessed them to God through Jesus Christ, He doesn't remember them. You know what? If we've been saved, if you've been saved and you've come to Jesus and asked Him to forgive you of your sins, you're not going to get to heaven and have a rap sheet. He's not going to sit down with you and say, you know what, you, you dummy, why did you do this here and you did this here and you did this here? Why did you do this? I have all this record of your sins. Why did you do these things? I can't believe you did these things. But welcome home. I mean, is that what Jesus is going to do? The Bible says when we've confessed our sins, He removes them as far as the east is from the west. And He remembers them no more. So friends, we should be the most joy-filled people. And you know what else we should be? He removes our sins that we might fear Him. There should be a holy reverence for the one that's forgiven of our, of our sins. You know why? Because our forgiveness cost Jesus his life. It was not an easy payment, you see. He paid the ultimate price so that we could be forgiven and so that we could be released. He paid the price for our release and it cost him his life. And we cannot in any way look upon Jesus and say, well, Jesus, gee, thanks. I appreciate that you've forgiven me. I know I can sin anytime I want because you'll just keep forgiving me. No, that's not the way this works. You know what? That'd be like me buying you the most wonderful sports car, the most expensive car you'd ever want to buy. <clears throat> and say, well, pastor, gee, thanks. Appreciate you buying me a new Corvette. And every day you go out and just beat it to smithereens. You know what? You... You don't take care of it. You drive it too fast. You don't put oil in the engine. And you beat on it a little bit with a hammer every day. You break out the windshield. You say, I'm so grateful for the gift, Pastor. I know it costs you everything. I'm just going to destroy it. Jesus paid the price for our forgiveness. And friends, listen. We need to fear Him. And we must not ever impose upon His grace and say, since He forgive us, I can sin. That's not, what, since, that's not the way this works. When we're forgiven, we fear God. But also when we're forgiven through Jesus, friends, we get up and we go, right? We take up our pallet of our guilt and shame and we go because we've been released from that which bound us. This man woke up that morning as a man who can walk, but I guarantee you he went to bed different. He walked himself and he laid himself down in his bed and he thanked Jesus that night. I don't know if he did or not. I would think so. He went to bed that night different than when he woke up. And I promise you, if you'll come to receive Christ as your Savior, you'll go to bed different tonight than you woke up. You woke up this morning and your guilt and shame and paralyzed by it. And if you'll come to Christ as our worship team come and you come this morning and give your life to Jesus and say, Jesus, forgive me my sins. He'll forgive you. And you'll go to bed tonight with great joy in your heart because Christ... And Christ alone can forgive you of your sins. Amen.